Let's continue. Verse 14. So since they could not save themselves, therefore they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life, and do not charge us with the innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. I want to ask you guys a question for a second. Why did the sailors call Jonah innocent? They know that this whole storm is his fault, right? We, we already established that. He told them about how he got there, how he was running from the Lord. They knew all this, right? They knew that it's because of him. He even said, I know that for my sake this has come upon you. They know that. So why do they say, do not lay on us, Lord, this innocent blood? Innocent? The man disobeyed God. The man's running from the presence of God. How do you mean innocent? Why do they say that? Let me tell you something. Okay? I told you that, that the Holy Spirit deliberately records things that point to Christ. Herein is a testimony. This, you know, obviously they're talking about Jonah. They don't know what they're saying, okay? These poor sailors, you know, like, they don't know what's going on. They went to Joppa, they picked up this foreign guy from Israel, you know. He gets on the ship, you know, seems kind of benign. They go on their, they go on their cruise, they go on their, their transport, you know, they're transporting goods and, and passengers. And all of a sudden, this, this insane storm comes against them, and they're about to die. This overwhelming force in the sea opposes them, opposes their passage. They're about to die. This ship is like to be broken. And finally, they cast lots, and they find out that this guy who was asleep in the lower part of the ship, it's his fault that this all happened. And this, he apparently displeased his God, and now his God has sent this storm. What would you think? What would you think if you were in this situation? These guys, these poor guys, they don't know what's going on. Why do they call him innocent? Let me tell you something, okay? The Holy Spirit recorded this deliberately. I don't think they realized what they were saying. Now, you might, someone might say, well, perhaps they're saying innocent because they don't think that drowning is equal to the crime, the sin that Jonah committed. As, like I said, as far as they know, probably Jonah's just going to die. They don't know that, there's a great, that God prepared a fish. They don't, they don't know that God prepared the whale. They don't know about that. As far as they know, they're going to throw him into the sea and he's going to die. So maybe they think that, well... Yes, he disobeyed his God, but surely that's not equal to dying in this storm on the sea. Maybe that's what they mean by innocent. I don't think so. They say innocent. They don't say that his, judgment, that his punishment is greater than his offense. They say that he's innocent. I believe the Holy Spirit is here recording a testimony. I believe the Holy Spirit is here recording a testimony of Christ. Again, it applies to Jonah, okay? Please understand. There's a literal interpretation, but underneath, hidden... There's a testimony of Jesus. Do you guys realize how many people in the trial of Christ during his passion testified that he was innocent? Pontius Pilate said, Pontius Pilate said, Why? What evil has he done? I find no fault in this man. The people said, Crucify him! He said, Why? What evil has he done? Take you him and crucify him. Paul says, I find no fault in this man. I find no cause of death in him. Pilate's wife, she says, to, she says to her husband, Have nothing to do with that just man, that righteous man, for I have suffered many things in a dream because of him. Pilate's wife. Pilate sends him to Herod when he found out that he was a Galilean. He belongs to Herod's jurisdiction. Herod could find no fault with him. He sends him back. He mocks him, but he sends him back, finding no fault. And Pilate testifies, I bring him before you that I may show you that I find no fault in this man. No, nor yet Herod. Herod did not find fault with him. Pilate actually gave Jesus to be scourged, hoping that it would appease the Jews. That it would appease the people who were crying out for his, for his death. He said, I will therefore chastise him and release him. Chastisement refers to the scourging. So first, in the book of John, he sent Jesus to the scourging. He, they scourged Jesus. And they put on him a purple robe, and the, and the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head. Horrible, you know. So they scourged him. They flogged him. Beat him. And so Pilate brings him out, and he says, Behold the man! And Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. 
right? So Pilate was hoping that this scourging would be enough. They would say, okay, maybe they'll relent. I don't know why they're so mad at this man. For some reason, he doesn't appear to me to be a malefactor, but maybe if I just inflict some chastisement, some corporal punishment on him, a severe punishment by, by Roman scourging, severe. If I inflict this on him, perhaps they'll, re they'll relent. But they didn't. They said, crucify him! Finally, Pilate delivered them. Pilate was a weak leader. He gave in to the will of the people when it was wrong for them to do so. You know who else? The Roman centurion who crucified him. There are four soldiers at the foot of the cross. This is, this is typical, actually, if you study crucifixion. It's typical, actually. Four soldiers to watch the cross to make sure that nothing happens to the body during the crucifixion. The, so the centurion who oversaw the very soldiers that nailed his hands and feet. The very soldiers who held the peg, the nail, and the, the mallet, the hammer, and drove them into his hands and feet. The very centurion who oversaw them. When Jesus died in the book of Luke said, the Bible says that he glorified God and said, surely this was a righteous man. That's four. You want to know the last one? The real kicker? It's Judas. Judas Iscariot. When Judas saw that he, Jesus was condemned, remember Judas traded Jesus to the Sanhedrin for 30 pieces of silver. He betrayed them. He showed them where to find him and when to take him. When Judas, saw, when Judas, however, saw that he was condemned, even to the point of death, the Bible says, Matthew, Matthew's account says in Matthew chapter 27 that he went to the priests, bringing the money with him. And he said, he said, I have sinned in that I have betrayed innocent blood. Even Judas, the son of perdition, even Judas said, five. Do you know that in the, in the law of Moses, it says that in the mouths of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. One of the ways that applies that actually, specifically in the point of judgment, when putting someone to death, the Bible says that you shall not put someone to death on the testimony of one witness, but in the mouth of two or three witnesses. That's one of the ways that that's applied. Two or three witnesses confirm a matter according to the law of Moses. I just gave you five, and there are more. Five. Did Jesus have sin? Did he have any offense? Did he commit any crime to die as a criminal? No. Why did he die? In due time, Christ died for the, un for the ungodly. The Holy One for the guilty. Amen. Let's look at the next verse. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea. And the sea ceased from its raging. It ceased. There was a great call. This, my friend, is called the gospel of peace. Do you know that when Jesus died on the cross, the Bible says in the Colossians that, Colossians chapter 1, he made peace by the blood of his cross, by him, to reconcile all things to God, whether things in heaven or on earth, even in him in the body of his flesh through death, so that he might present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Do you know that if you are reconciled to God in the blood of Christ, by, by faith in him, do you know that, you, that Jesus himself, not you, he is the one who has brought you, he has served as a priest, bringing you to the presence of God, and presented you, saying, look, Father, look at, look at, your, look at your child. He presents you holy, unblameable, not blamed, no fault find, finding, and unreprovable in God's sight. God's sight, not man's. How? Because his blood has cleansed your sin. His blood has made atonement for all your sins. Do we have sins? Yes. But Jesus' blood has atoned for sin. He has made peace by the blood of his cross. He has made peace. peace. When Jesus died on the cross, do you know that the heavens opened again? When Jesus was hanging on the cross, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all record this, the Synoptic Gospels. 
If you're not familiar, the term synoptic gospels refers to the first three gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John, the fourth gospel, because of its differences, because of the disparities between it and the other three, and the large similarities between those three, is kind of put in a category by itself. We call it synoptic. Synoptic is a comes from Koine Greek, actually. The prefix soon, soon, soon is Koine Greek for with, like close association, togetherness, with, with. Optic, optic like optometrist, it actually comes from a Greek term optonomai, which literally, which has to do with vision, sight. So synoptic means to see together. The reason they're called that is because the three gospels, like I said, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they record many things very similarly. They show Jesus, his life, his ministry, his death, his resurrection, in very similar comparative manners, in very similar way, okay? That's why they're called that. Do you know that when G in the Synoptic Gospels it's recorded that there was dark, while Jesus was on the cross, there was darkness from all the land, on, over all the land from the sixth hour till about the ninth hour. Now that didn't begin at the moment he was hanging on the cross. He, w he was crucified at about the third hour, Mark says. He was crucified at about the third hour, the Gospel says. But, there was darkness over the land from the sixth hour to the ninth hour. This is the middle of the day, by the way. The middle of the day. They're not using our form of measurement of time with a.m. p.m., you know. They're measuring by evening and morning, okay? But this is the middle of the day. The sixth hour to the ninth hour, there was darkness right in the middle of the day. As the prophet Amos says, darkness shall be at noonday. So also Jesus, when he hung on the cross, when he hung on the, when he hung on the tree, there was darkness over the land from the sixth hour to the ninth hour. Why? It was judicial. This darkness was judicial, like it was in the plagues of Egypt, when there was darkness over all the land, even a darkness that could be felt. This was a judgment. Judgment. It was divine. God ordained this. Although Jesus suffered at the, at the hands of wicked men, at the wicked hands of men, taken crucified and slain, yet God ordained these things. Peter says in Acts chapter 4, listen to this, okay, listen. God ordained Jesus' sufferings. Peter says in prayer, when the apostles were gathered together, just praying over their persecution, they prayed to God saying, for a, of a truth against your holy child Jesus. Herod and Pontius Pilate and the rulers of the people were gathered together for to do whatever your hand and your will your counsel determined beforehand to be done. Amazing. What Jesus suffered, he suffered according to the will of God. Was it right for the people to condemn him? No. Their hearts, the sinister motives of their heart were plain. They abused all manner of proper justice to condemn him. But God is the one, the Bible says, who delivered up his son. Again, same word, to give up, to surrender over, to give into the hands of. He delivered him over. Why? So that he would suffer for sin. So that in his suffering, God could lay on him the iniquity of us all. That's why. And do you know that? Once the light broke again, Jesus said, it is finished. Light broke again. He finished the judgment. He looked up to heaven in the Gospel of Luke and he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And he bowed his head and he breathed out his last. He delivered up his spirit. He died. Do you know that that was the satisfaction of justice? The propitiation. Peace is established. Judgment against your sin, Jesus has borne. He bore him, himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree. Because God loves you. God didn't want you to bear it. He loves you. There was a great calm. Immediately, once Jonah hit, went into the sea, there was a great calm. The sea stopped. The storm ended. God's wrath against your sins, if you believe in Jesus Christ, if you are in the risen Christ, if you are made alive in him, God is no more wrath. This is the gospel of peace. Be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to him. He loves you. His, he is peaceable to you. Come into his friendship. Now someone may say, but Ethan, 
If you say that there's no anger against sin, if you say that there's no wrath, well then, well, people might just continue, might just go out and sin. They'll think they can just do whatever they want. No problem. Sin doesn't matter. Listen, let's read the next verse. Jonah chapter 1, verse 16. After the storm ceased, remember, the sea ceased from her raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. Let me tell you something, okay? It's not true. Okay, it's not true that if you tell people your sins are forgiven, God is no more angry with you. God is not counting your trespasses against you. If you tell people that because of Christ, because of him who brought, who announced peace, peace, peace to him who is far off and to him who is near, because of that, what happened? Did the men, great, we can do whatever we want. Let's sin. No, they feared exceedingly. They fear to the Lord. By the way, fear the Lord doesn't mean, oh, they're afraid, you know, they think God's going to destroy them. That's not what fear means. Fear is the worship of the Lord. Even Jesus, you know, had to fear of God. Observe the life of Christ. Do you know that in Isaiah chapter 10 or chapter, excuse me, chapter 11? I might be remembering it wrong. It says this concerning, concerning the stem, the branch out of the, out of the stem of Jesse. It says this concerning him, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest on him. The spirit, the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. It's a sevenfold spirit of God that Jesus was anointed with. He was anointed with the Holy Spirit and with power. A sevenfold spirit. The, the, the seventh element of this spirit is the spirit of the fear of the Lord. But observe the life of Jesus. Does Jesus ever go around afraid of his father? Afraid that God might, might strike him? Afraid that, you know, God, Father, please, please receive me into your presence. Please. He has no such quarrel. He has peace. He has peace towards God, always. You say, well, what about his sins, Ethan? His sins were not for himself. Jesus didn't suffer because he sinned. He suffered because we sinned. It was, the, it was the love of God that delivered up his son to die, to save our lives, to save us alive. It was the purpose of the love of God. Jesus didn't spend his life afraid of God, afraid of the Father. No, he feared the Lord. That means he worshipped, he had an honor, he reverenced, he worshipped him. That's how it's always used in the Old Testament. I'm not going to go on too far a rabbit trail with that today. I'll show you guys about the fear of the Lord, Lord willing, another time. But the men feared the Lord and offered a sacrifice and took vows. What about sacrifice? You say, but Ethan, I thought Jesus is our sacrifice. Yes, but don't you know that the Bible says that we will render the calves of our lips? What's calves? A calf is oftentimes a sacrificial animal. What does it mean calves of our lips? It means the sacrifice of praise. Hebrews chapter 13 says, You give thanks to his name, offering up the sacrifice of praise to God through Christ continually. The sacrifice of praise. It's not a sacrifice that atones for sin. It's a thanks, it's what you might call a shalem, a, a peace, a thanksgiving offering, a free will offering. It's not an atoning offering. It's not to bear sin and trespass. Amen? So the people offered a sacrifice to the Lord and paid vows and took vows. Now, question to those of you who say that, well, Ethan, you're saying that, you know, you know, people don't need to obey the commandments of God. Now, listen, I'm not saying people don't need to obey commandments, okay? I'll explore this again, Lord willing. I keep saying this some other day, but I, I don't have time to teach the whole Bible in one sitting. This is already a couple hours. Okay, but... What I'm saying is this, that faith in the Lord Jesus Christ saves. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ saves. Peter says, we believe because of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved even as they. Not by we work to be saved. We believe. It's by his grace. His grace. But does that produce unclean, unclean living? Does that produce, you know, callousness? Oh, I don't care. I can do whatever I want. I can... No, it doesn't do that. 
See, that's what religious people say it will do. That's not what it actually does. The fruit of the gospel is evident. They fear the Lord. They offered sacrifices and took vows. Cannot the Holy Spirit whom we have today do a greater work than this? By the way, I want to share something wonderful with you, okay? I'm going to share with you something about Jonah as a type of Christ. I'm going to show you how Jesus and Jonah are similar by comparing where Jonah is from. Remember I mentioned earlier that Jonah is from Gathhefer? A town called Gathhefer. Gathhefer. Gathhefer is a city, a town in the region of Zebulun. Why is that important? Let me show you. Remember I showed you from 2 Kings chapter 14, 25, right? He's from Gathhefer. Let me show you Joshua chapter 19, 10, and 13. Okay? Don't worry, I'm going with it. We're somewhere with this, okay? Just please follow with me, okay? Please follow along with me. I'm going somewhere with this. Let me show you Joshua chapter 10, chapter 19, verses 10 and 13. The third lot came out for the children of Zebulun. Now, if you're not familiar with this, in the nation of Israel, in the time of Joshua, there were 12 tribes, right? The 12 sons of Israel became the 12 tribes. Zebulun is, is the 10th son of Jacob. Okay? The 10th son of Israel. The 10th tribe. So each tribe is their own inheritance, their own portion of land in the land of Israel, right? So this is the inheritance, the land of Zebulun within the nation of Israel, okay? Just for clarity's sake. The third lot came out for the children of Zebulun, according to their families, and the border of their inheritance was as far as Sarid. Now watch verse 13. This is still the land of Zebulun. And from there it passed along the east of Gath-Hefer toward eth and extended to Rimon, which borders Nea. Now, so Gath-Hefer is a town in Zebulun. Why does that matter, Ethan? Who cares? Like, what does it matter? Well, you know, why bother? Why, why, you know, why burden us with all these details? It, it matters. Let me show you something. In John chapter 7, verse 52, the Pharisees are contending with one another. They're arguing about, well, how can this Jesus be a Messiah? The people hold him to be a prophet. But they answered and said to Nicodemus specifically, who was actually defending him. They said, are you also from Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee arises no prophet. You say, Ethan, what does Galilee have to do with Zebulun. Zebulun is in the land of Galilee. Do you know that Jesus was a prophet? He lived in Galilee. Now, he was born in Bethlehem, right? In Judea, in Judah, where David was born, where David was from. But he lived, he was brought up in Nazareth of Galilee. Why is that important? The Pharisees aren't studying their Bible, to be plain. They're not studying their Bible because Jonah was also from Galilee. Zebulun is part of the region of Galilee. Zebulun and Naphtali are from part of the region of Galilee. They said, search and look. Yeah, they should search and look, because there were prophets from Galilee. One of them was Jonah, the son of Amittai. As Jonah, so Christ. You, again, a type of Christ. Jesus is from Galilee. So is Jonah. Watch this. In Matthew chapter 4, it says, the region of Zebulun and the region of Naphtali, Beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, Galilee of the nations, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. That's Jesus. In Zebulun. Now, you say, well, why, again, why does this matter? It's great that Jesus is from Galilee and Jonah is from Galilee. Why does this matter? Okay, watch, listen. Do you realize that these sailors, all these guys that Jonah was with, are not Jews? They're Gentiles. Jonah reveals the gospel to the Gentiles, to the nations. It's not primarily about the gospel to the Jewish people, although it begins with them. Listen to me. Listen. Listen plainly. The gospel is to the Jew first, then to the Greek. Romans 1. Always. It began with them. Jesus sent the apostles first to Jerusalem, where he was crucified. He sent them first there. The gospel is always to them first, to the Jewish people, to the seed of Abraham, the, seed of, the natural seed of Abraham and the seed of Jacob. Always to them first. They have the first pick, the first pickings. But Jonah reveals the gospel to the nations. God sent him to Nineveh, Gentile city, and he's in a boat with Gentiles. So who are these men who feared the Lord exceedingly, who offered sacrifice to the Lord, took vows? Are they men who know the law of Moses? Are they men who can tell you the commandments that God gave? Are they men who can tell you the precepts and statutes of the covenant? No. They're Gentiles. They were men who before, you remember earlier, were calling on their own gods. But here, they worship God. They worship the true God. 
Would you call that repentance? Would you call that holiness? I would. How is it brought about? By teaching them, you must obey this, do this, com- obey this commandment, keep... No, you know how it was? It was by the forgiveness of sins. It was by, t- it was by the end of wrath. It was by peace from God. Peace. See, when people know that they have peace with God, their life becomes good. Even these, um, even these Gentiles, these people from the nations, knowing nothing of the true God before this, knowing not the commandments ordained by Moses, worshiped God. And was God, did God receive their worship? Did God receive their offerings and their vows? Yes. God doesn't save by works of the law, people. God saves by faith. God saves by the grace of Christ. These men didn't know the law. It was the grace of God that delivered up his son to die in our place, to bear the judgment, to create peace. Let's go to verse 17. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. I'm going to skip over to chapter 2, verse 10. So the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto the dry land. Now you remember how Jesus said that as Jonah was in the heart of the fish, out of the great fish three days and three nights, so the Son of Man must be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. God spared Jonah. Do you know that? Jonah didn't die. By the way, for anyone who suggests that, well, you know, how can a man be in a fish's belly? Look, number one, God can preserve his life. But number two, do you know that actually incidents have occurred where people have been found within the bellies of whales and other large sea creatures? That's happened. God is able. God is able to preserve him. It vomited him onto the dry land. Jesus also went, he died. He actually died. He was not just you know, going through suffering. He died, people. Jesus was delivered over to death. Jonah wasn't. God spared Jonah. Now, what Jonah went through was miserable. Certainly. Definitely miserable. But he was spared. His life was preserved. Jesus died. What is the gospel? What is the gospel about? Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I deliver to you, first of all, as a first importance, or first of all, as a first importance, what I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised out of the dead the third day, according to the scriptures. Christ was raised out of the dead the third day. What is the effect of all this? What does it mean? What's the effect of all this work? Why does Jesus have to go through these things? Let's turn again to Romans chapter 4. This is where we're going to close, and then I want to pray for you. Romans chapter 4, verse 22. Again, speaking of Abraham, and therefore it was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. His faith was accounted. His faith was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, this was not written for his sake alone, that it was imputed to him. In other words, that God justified Abraham, pronounced him righteous, declared him righteous by faith, was not just written for Abraham. It wasn't just for him. Again, all the scripture is for our learning. It's for our instruction. All of it is for our instruction. doesn't mean all of it is about us directly, but all of it is for our learning. Watch. It was not written for Abraham's sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us. Righteousness shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Now watch this. Who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised up because of our justification. Again, people, Jesus didn't suffer because of, his, because of his sins, because of himself. He had none. He was delivered up to die, to suffer on the cross, because of our trespasses against God, our offenses. Sin requires an atonement. Sin must have a recompense. But God himself provided the lamb to bear away the sin of the world. What does it mean he was delivered up because of our trespasses? and raised up because of our justification. It means this. When he suffered, he did not suffer for himself. Do you know that in that he lives, he does not live for himself either? I can't explore that thought entirely, but I'm going to tell, I'm going to make this statement. The life that Jesus now lives, he lives in the virtue of the death that he died. If you don't understand, I apologize. I'm going to have to explain that another day. But he was raised up because of our justification. What does that mean? He was raised, he was raised again from the dead because of our justification. 
What does that mean? It means, what it means is this. When Jesus suffered on the cross, every righteous requirement for penalty against the trespasses that he was suffering for were completely satisfied. So in the mind of God, everything necessary for justification is accomplished, is prepared. Righteousness is settled. Righteousness is accomplished. And so he was raised out of the dead as the living proof of our justification. If he did not successfully put away sins, he would not have been raised from the dead. He was raised not to justify us. He was not raised to justify us. He was raised raised because of our justification. In other words, because justification, because the acquittal from guilt before God has been accomplished on our behalf, he was raised from the dead. That's what it means. That's why Jonah came out again. That's why Jesus suffered for us, suffered the storm. He settled the sea. He settled the, the judgment. He settled it, and he was raised from the dead. You don't need to suffer for your own mistakes. You don't need to fear God anymore. You don't need to keep beating yourself. Stop cutting yourself. Stop. Another man was marred for you. Don't punish yourself anymore. God forgives you. He loves you. You can be a part of his family. Chapter 5, verse 1, next verse. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's all of what I've been teaching you. Peace with God. How is peace with God accomplished? Because we try, because we give up things? No, it's because one man, the Son of Man, went down into the heart of the earth and came up again. By Him, because of Him, through Him, we have peace with God. We are reconciled to God, and God's anger is put away. Peace means no more wrath. It means no more it means no more hostility. It means cessation of conflict. God is not against you for your sin, and you are no more in the flesh once you believe in Christ to have enmity against God. You are in the spirit, in his love, from him and to him. That's what it means. We have peace with God. I'm going to skip down. I'm going to close with this, okay? This is the gospel, people. Romans chapter 5, verses 7 to 9. Watch the love of God, people. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What does this mean? It means this. Do you know that, generally speaking, people won't die for someone else? Generally speaking. Largely speaking, generally, people will look after their own interests. You know, Paul says in one place, all men look after their own interests. I have no men that will look after the needs of others like Timothy. Everyone kind of looks after their own well-being. Some people, however, sometimes will die for a righteous person, a just person, an upright person, an honorable, lawful person. Perhaps some would dare to die for a good person. Someone we all agree is good. But watch the love of God. In that God commands, in contradistinction to all of this, God did not send his son to die for good people or just people. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That is the love of God. God doesn't love you because you've done something good. God loves you. He loved you when you were a sinner. He loves you now. We're all sinners, okay? Including and especially the speaker. But God loves, loved us. And he sent his son to die on behalf of sinners. Now, what's the effect? What does this death of Christ for sinners result in? What does it produce? Next verse. I'm going to close with this. This has been the subject of my message this entire time. Romans chapter 5, verse 9. I, I admonish you, commit this to memory. You will need it. For, war, for spiritual warfare, you will need it to defend your heart and mind. You will need this verse. Romans chapter 5, verse 9. Much more than having now been justified by his blood... By Christ's blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. That's the gospel. Why did Jesus shed his blood? Because we were guilty, and our guilt demands the penalty of death. But he shed his own blood. He died for us, so that we might be declared righteous, might be pronounced justified in the sight of God, 
in his blood. The Greek is literally in his blood. Young's literal translation puts it as being therefore declared righteous in his blood. Declared righteous in his blood. We are declared righteous in his blood. His blood pronounces us justified. His blood is brought, is sprinkled before the throne of the Father in heaven. His blood cleanses. His blood saves. And what's the result? We shall be saved from wrath through him. Again, Young's literal translation says, we shall be saved from the wrath, from the wrath, because of him or through him. There is a definite day of judgment appointed, people. This age is coming to a close. I'm not saying the Lord's going to appear tomorrow, but I'm saying I'm looking forward to his appearing. I don't know when he will appear, but this age is coming to a close. There will be a day of judgment. There will be the resurrection of the dead. It will occur. And we who are alive and remain will be changed and brought up together to meet the Lord in the air. And we will be with the Lord. We will not go to judgment. We will not go to wrath. When you believe in Christ, you will go to salvation. He is alive for your salvation. God has not appointed you to wrath. He has, he has saved you from the wrath through him. You say, well, but Ethan, that's the day of judgment. What about now? How can I know? No, listen. Having well, Look at the verse. Look at, look, look at verse 9 again. Having now been justified in his blood been justified by his blood. We shall be saved from the wrath through him. So the second clause, we shall be saved from the wrath through him, is obviously future tense. And it's conditional upon the effectiveness of the previous clause, which is having now been declared righteous in his blood. So the question is, are you declared righteous in his blood? If you have faith in Jesus Christ, you are. You are justified in his blood. You don't need to worry, well, you know, someday, you know, when I meet God, you know, who knows whether, you know, who knows whether I'll make it. No. You are justified in his blood. You will be. Not maybe, perhaps, optative tense, you know, like, hopefully. No. You shall be saved from the wrath because of him. God is not holding your sins against you. He met your sins on Christ. If you are in Christ... You are alive from the dead in him. Amen. What a gospel. What a peace. God loves you. People, if you've never received Jesus, come to him now. He's not angry with you. I hope I've declared to you a God who is so ready, who is so willing to receive you. A God ready to forgive. A God abundant in mercy. Do you know he cares for you? He's not far from any one of us. He's searching for you. It's no mistake that you're listening to this. God is for you. Receive him. Don't delay. Receive him. Don't refuse Jesus and keep trying to row harder to give up cargo. Don't. Let Christ be the sacrifice for your sins. Stop punishing yourself. Stop trying to save yourself. Just give up. Give up. Trust his grace. He is sufficient. If you have not received Jesus before as Savior, I want to lead you in a prayer right now. You're listening to this on purpose. And I think many of you listening to this, your heart has been warmed. You know, you're coming, you're falling in love with this Jesus you're hearing about. And for those of you who know him already, I believe your, your, your heart also is being warmed. You're hearing about the Lord that you've loved so long. And you're enjoying him, the fellowship you have with him. My friend, the gift of God is eternal life. God wants you to have life, not destruction. He wants you to have life. I want to lead you in this prayer. If you've never received the Lord Jesus as Savior, it's not hard to be saved, my friend. It is not hard. The Bible says, the prophet Joel says, Whosoever, whoever will call on the name of the Lord shall be saved, will be delivered, will be saved. If you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him out of the dead, you will be saved. It's not difficult to be saved. Believe. Believe and confess him. Believe with your heart. Don't go through motions. Believe. Believe. Confess with your mouth. God has appointed you to salvation. God loves you. Pray this prayer, people. I want, to, I want you to repeat after me if you've never received the Lord Jesus as Savior. I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Okay? Close your eyes. I want to introduce you to your new father. I want to introduce you to your new family. Pray this prayer. Say, 
Lord God, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for my sins. I believe that you have raised him out of the dead. Lord Jesus, I believe you are Christ and Lord of my life. Thank you for being my savior. Lord God, thank you now for becoming my father. Thank you, Father. In the name of your son. Amen. 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 God bless you. There's a there's a party in heaven happening right now if you receive Jesus. You know that? Jesus said there's joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. There's a party happening right now celebrating you. God has looked forward to the day when he would be introduced to you. He loves you. If you did receive the Lord Jesus, please leave me a comment. I do want to know. I want to rejoice with you. The Lord loves you. Walk with him. Pray to him. Call out to him. Get invested in a local church. Seek the Lord. Seek his mind. Receive his gifts. Receive from his word. His word is beautiful. Receive from him. People, I love you. God bless you. I love you, people. I'm doing this for you. This labor really is my labor to the Lord and to you. It's for your benefit. It's for your blessing. It's food for you. Be blessed. Grace and peace. Hey, everyone. Thanks so much for listening to this message. I'm confident the word blessed you. Make sure to give a watch to other videos on my channel, like, and subscribe for more. If you'd like to continue to receive these messages, consider supporting me via the donation link in the description box. Also, check out my dad Craig's YouTube page. You can find the link for that in the description box as well. Finally, I'd like to ask for your help in finishing construction of an orphanage in Northern Thailand. This Ambassador Ministries project is to house 50 orphans. We're really close to being done and we just need a little more support to cross the finish line. Watch this two minute video about this project and then click the link in the description box if you'd like to give. Thank you in advance for your generosity. Grace and peace.